next speaker is uh, Walid Sari. He joins us all the way from Saudi Arabia, um, and he is going to be talking about uh, uh, NetOps. And uh, um, uh, I'm looking very much forward to your uh, session. So uh, please uh, take it away. If you just last, last time, if you just came in, please move into the middle because people are coming in all the time, and we don't want them to. Uh, go uh, hello, folks. Uh, my name is Walid. I work in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I am a system engineer, basically managing HPC Linux clusters. Uh, I started the uh, interest in configuration management automation since 2007 with CF Engine. Led the proof of concept for uh, Ansible, Puppet, Chef, and CF Engine on uh, 2012. 2014 led the project to implement Puppet Enterprise on the uh, company. And recently, uh, I have been approached by the network management team to help them on automation. I have three kids, three lovely kids, Net, Dev, and, oh, oh sorry, uh, uh, three lovely kids. I wanted to name them Net, Dev, and Ops, but uh, the user namespace didn't allow me. Anyway, so when the network management team approached me, I was excited because I love Kubernetes. And in Kubernetes, if you are in, from the operation background, yes, there is lots of network stuff going on. Simple thing is basically the queue proxy and the IP tables. Uh, there is Envoy, there is the service mesh, there is STO. There is lots of things that basically I thought, okay, the moment I'm in the network management team, I will learn all this stuff and I know what exactly is going under the hood. It didn't happen. <laughs> didn't really. Uh, so this was one, my motivation, my incentive to join the uh, network team. But it's my key takeaway. If another team approaches you, say yes. The mindset, the opportunities that you will see in the, a different team, the assumptions that we have are completely amazing. It's completely different. We talk about DevOps, but you will not experience DevOps until you join another team. For example, so. I presented Kubernetes, which is supposed to be a check mark. Each presentation has to have Kubernetes. There's a cat, another check mark. Uh, for example, the project Calico. Uh, anybody know the project Calico, by the way? Good. Uh, so I don't need to talk about it. If you look at the project Calico, this is design and build decisions. It's amazing. When you, when you hear about SDN controllers, I'm not a network engineer, but when you hear about SDN controllers and about the high availability and it, you need to make it highly available and it's not, uh, it cannot be for the enterprise. You see at Project, Project Calico, it scales with every compute node you add. Every compute node you add to your Kubernetes cluster or to your virtualization, it basically scales out. And if you don't believe me, listen to the word of the uh, CTO of Bubbit, Nigel Kristen. He says that this year, 2018, will be the, the year of the network automation. And not just network automation, it will be continuous integration, continuous delivery for network, which is crazy because network is really behind. If you look at, I mean, how many network engineers here, by the way? Oh man, I'm the wrong guy. <laughs> 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 huh? How many operations engineers, systems engineers? Uh, you are a systems and operation uh, network at the same time. How many dev? Okay. Okay. I am in the wrong room, definitely. <laughs> so I'm not, my, my disclaimer, I'm not a network engineer. I learned a lot about networking, but uh, I'm still getting it wrong. And I hope if I do anything wrong or I say anything wrong, correct me. So Nigel Kirsten basically, he put it really beautiful, put it really nice. If you read it, it's really nice. I cannot put it any other way like him. Last week, there was a tech day for Red Hat. And one of the presentation by the company called The Glue. And he presented, Sven, he presented the microservices in a very nice way. Uh, it's on YouTube, if you want to see it. But look at the architecture. They have three data centers. One is for disaster recovery for the split plane. So it's not really like a data center hosting host. It's just hosting the uh, arbitrator, and each data center has three hosts. Imagine if the number of hosts are 10, 100. Imagine if each host has hundreds of containers. What kind of network you would see here? And imagine when the host goes down 
and the containers need to load balance, what kind of flows will happen? Can you imagine the complexity of the network setup? Who's going to manage it? Is it the developer? Is it the administrator? Is it the network engineer? Who is going to manage it, you know? Probably you guys, because if I ask who is the network engineer, you raise your hand. Who is the operation, you raise your hand. So, yeah. So imagine the complexity of the network that we are going to see because of containers, because of microservices, because of the new initiatives that we have. Yeah. So network automation, the message that I'm going to give you, needs to uh, key up the base, especially in the enterprise. I'm not talking about the cloud, by the way. Uh, my context is from the enterprise, physical network switches, physical traditional network switches. So we need to start the journey. And the journey, we need to tackle three areas. We need to tackle the, basically the culture, the people, the technology, and the process. The most important thing, this is my third activity related to configuration management. And I know uh, the, main, the main failure, or the main basically uh, thing that will pull you down, or pull you back, is basically uh, the people you are working with. If you cannot convince the people you are working with, if you cannot convince your management, your leadership, uh, about the new transition of culture, about the new benefits and stuff like this, your project will not go forward. Technology, it's very easy to choose a tool. If you choose the wrong tool, you have a technical depth. So what? Process will come along. You might choose the wrong process, but then you find out and you fix it. But people, you cannot fix it. It takes time to educate people. It takes time to basically uh, transition the culture. So my other takeaway, take care of your people. So what's the context? Where I come from? What kind of, uh, so if I, basically what I'm trying to do, what I was trying to do, I was trying to give you a blueprint of how you do a network automation activity uh, if you are a system engineer. But I didn't manage to do it. But if you are going to do it, first you need this uh, work scope. You need scope of work. You need to put context. You need to understand whom you are talking to. When are you going to start? When you are going to end? Who are, you, who are your uh, stakeholders? And who are the key stakeholders? Okay? And what technologies you are going to use? All, all of these things. So let's imagine that uh, because I cannot tell you much about the company, let's imagine that there is a virtual Acme company that has a campus, which are nine buildings, and has a data center, which are four data centers. It has a team of five for uh, network engineers and a team of five for cable and access control. Uh, the number of switches that they are under control of this management team are around less than a 200. But the number of switches that are delegated are not under them, but they have to solve as the first lines of support uh, the issues, are more than that, much more than that. So the number of uh, endpoints is around 57,000 points. Uh, they have a DNS, info blocks. So this is one automation point. They are not using it for automation. They have uh, part of the info blocks. You have an IB address management system. Uh, they have a network management system using SNMB. They have also uh, using, they have been using for a long time the traditional three tier system. So basically you have your core switches, you have your distribution or aggregated layer, and then you have the, your access layers. And sometimes they are mirrored. So basically, from data center to data center, the core will be back to back. They do lots of changes, upgrades, uh, new, uh, new HPC clusters, new servers, whatever. So probably every week, there must be a change. They, they do also lots of troubleshooting, performance troubleshooting. And always there is a new application. Constraints. Uh, and in the data center, we don't have access to the internet. It's a very linear process. Uh, there is lots of uh, controls, especially security-wise. So that's the context. It's a very traditional company with a very traditional team. 
okay? And they want to start automation. So what kind of automation is out there? Let's say there are, we will classify them differently. So basically you have the CLI. The CLI, this is what Cisco teaches us. Cisco teaches us as uh, CCIEs and stuff like this. If you want to be the CCIE, you have to do things from the command line serially, one device at a time. So the vendor caused us the, uh, the problem on automation. The uh, Cisco have changed their curriculum, by the way, the CCNA curriculum now, and they have something called program programmability on the curriculum. Uh, Junibar, they have a special course by themselves. So the first one, just basically cut and paste and using not bad. Okay, there's nothing special, very traditional. The second is that people started using Python scripting, they're using Perl, Tickle, Expect, some, some of them using Excel to change the template, to change the configuration. And some of them started using Puppet, Ansible, CF Engine, Chef, Salt, and Stackstorm. The people that started using Stackstorm, they moved a little bit more. They are using Event. So basically now they are look at the logs, they look at the SMB traps, they look at telemetry, and they can take action based on telemetry. So this is a step more. There is the new intent-based networking. One thing I learned about networking, they cannot agree on a term. When you say, who knows what SDN means? Hmm? No, I don't mean, I know what you mean. <laughs> no, for example, if you ask two people to define SDN, they will not define it the same. Some will say well, it's basically an ob uh, a technology based on overflow. Somebody else will say, but you'll have different definitions, okay? In I, uh, intent based, intent based uh, networks, how many heard about intent based networks? Okay, a few. So intent based networks is like what we say in Bobbit and Chef and we say the desired state. Okay, so the desired state is the intent. But the network, some people take it a little bit further. They introduce machine learning, they introduce statistical modeling. So they want basically to, to say, okay, this is my business logic, this is my business rules, and now go ahead and do it. Okay, so you give guidance, but the actual configuration will come from other methods. And some basically will just use Ansible and say that's desired or intent-based networking. So these are the types. We'll come back to them, okay? So where are we? Oh, there's something wrong with this one. There should be an image. Okay, here it is. So where are we? We are in the first step. <laughs> we are using the command line because we have CCIEs, GCIEs, whatever. Uh, by the way, we are heterogeneous. We have lots of uh, different uh, brand types. Uh, we do things serially. So if there is an upgrade for 50 switches, we'll do one switch at a time. But what we do, we open 50 terminals, and we can do it a little bit quicker. <laughs> yeah? Uh, there is a trick in TMOC where you can actually push one command faster. So this is basically a human problem. One research, say from 20 to 70% of blackout errors in data center is from this uh, methods. I just made it up, by the way. No. <laughs> so uh, one white box uh, vendor is making fun that the only thing changed in, like, in the last 20 years is moving from Telnet to SSH. So why we are not automating? What reasons? The first thing, actually, is the vendors themselves. They are teaching us not to automate. The way they teach us to be really good engineers, not to automate. Do it from the command line. The other thing is the way we work. Operations, like, it's a, another technical fad, like DevOps, like whatever. The, something else will come up, okay? Some people will say, uh, our environment is really complex. We are heterogeneous environment. We are traditional. There is no way that there is a solution that will fit us. Another one will say, it's cost prohibitive. And we are small. 
it's th this automation is for Google, for Facebook. It's not for us. Yeah. Another one is we are we are busy. Come on, let's do a double grade. Forget this now. <laughs> yes. So th there are lots of excuses, and each excuse you can actually turn it back. Okay. Some the ones that are good, I don't know where to start, and that's why this is presentation. So. We have one senior engineer. He tried actually to automate things. He was a senior engineer, and he's the eldest actually among the group, a little bit my age. Uh, so he created a template engine using Visual Basic. It's good user interface. <laughs> well, it's really good user interface. Believe me, I'm not. Uh, yes, it's a good user interface. It's good as a start point for myself to get what kind of data they want to capture. Okay? But what problems he made? This is a lesson on how to fail network automation. This one. First, first thing, ask if you want to develop something. We have developers. He never used any development tool. He never used like user interface design or anything. He did everything from scratch lines, statements. All this design was like took him one month to do. He didn't use Git, he didn't use Lint, he didn't use any development tool. Okay? He never approached any developer. He never approached his team. So basically if you want to fail an automation project, do this. <laughs> yes. So we failed one activity. So we said, let's, fail, uh, I mean, let's start a new one. So we start a new one. The first thing we do, we want to know information. We want to gather information. That's the first thing I really would like to know. So we click start a uh, brainstorming session. In this brainstorming session, it's actually two ways. It's one way to educate them, to basically make them aware what is out there. Another way to educate myself to know what they are doing and what kind of tools, what kind of problems, what kind of time they can allocate, and things like this. So it's a two-way, and you have to do this as often as you can. Interviews, shadowing, this is the way you can get more information. Okay? I learned this the hard way. So for example, the word NetOps, the word NetDevOps, it doesn't come across them. They are really busy. Yeah? So you wanted to know, and you wanted to make them aware. Uh, when they have troubleshooting for performance or anything like this, is the visibility tool that they have right now, is it enough? What can they do to improve it? What kind of automation they would like? What kind of challenges they are facing? All of this are the co going to be your task list. Okay? So, maybe they are using automation already. Like, for example, I said info blocks. Okay? Maybe, uh, some people don't think DHCP is an automation tool. It is an automation tool. You do dynamic provisioning with it and stuff like this, and they are using it heavily. For the network access control, they are doing profiling. Uh, the board activation stuff like this is done automatically. This is automation. Automation doesn't have to be using an automation framework. It doesn't. If you are using the vendor tools already to automate your activity using hardware, using vendor software that comes with your solution, that's fine. The second thing, you need to get your management approval. Yeah? So you need to find what cause or what goal that basically management will buy in and will give you the resources you need. And it's very easy. So it could be a pressing need, something that a project that we need now. Or it could be an opportunity. And we have all of these. So just choose the one that is close to the heart of your management for your leadership. Tasks. So I need a list of tasks so we can start. There was a, there is a, a good community, Network to Code. It's one of the best open source DevOps community I have seen. Uh, I asked the stupid questions on this uh, Slack channel and they answered me. I asked it again, they will answer me again. It's really one of the very cooperative. You can ask, what is an IB? And they will answer you. Yeah, it's really a good channel, a good Slack channel. Uh, so they run a survey, and they're going to run another one actually this year. Uh, so, 
And this survey they asked lots of questions. One of the questions is basically what tasks you want to automate. So if you look, the main ones is basically configuration management. Sometimes we confuse the word automation and configuration management. There was a, a talk this morning about automation and orchestration. I haven't attended it, sorry. But uh, basically, we sometimes mix up our definitions. So if you look at the first one, archive, backup. That is not risky. That's good enough. Uh, generation, templating, that's good enough also. Uh, deploy, stay away from this yet. You don't want to do deploys until you master your system, until you know basically what solution you are going to give them and how to test it, how to validate it before you do writes. Try to do the reads first. Reporting, yeah, that's excellent. The other ones, forget them for now. Try just to find one task, one simple task to do. Okay? <laughs> it doesn't work. Every time you go to a network engineer, you say, okay, I want to automate. He say, okay, let's start with VLANs. No, let's start with a simple one. Let's read. No, 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 let's configure VLANs. Yeah? No, it doesn't work. The other one is basically spanning tree. Spanning tree by default comes with the wrong tuning parameters, so you have to uh, adjust them. And this is one of the common issues that we have. The third one is usually firewall policies. Okay, they want to sync them, they want basically to control them in a certain way, granular way, which if they had Calico, it would be done granular for them, but we don't have SDN, unfortunately. So, you have to parameterize. You have to know what kind of task, you have a list of tasks. You have to know what tasks that are highest priority. In terms of perceived value, perceived value to whom? To the team, to the business, to yourself, to the business. If it's not to the business, to the team, to the operations, to the user. Remember, application is king, by the way. Yeah? When we talk about Kubernetes, we don't care about the underlying network. We don't care about the SDN. We care about deploying the application. Okay? So your priority is, does it affect the user? If it affects the user, that's the one that you want to target. Okay? Is it complex? If it is complex, stay away from it for a moment. Is it once a year? Or is it like once in a blue moon. Forget it. So take the tasks that are easy, that are simple, and have the highest business value. Oops. Yes? I want to emphasize this. Don't take the hard task. There is, when you automate, you don't have to automate everything. There is something you need to automate. There is something that you stay away from. Stay away from things. Okay, so in the beginning, when I classified the uh, management methods or management strategies, we said the second one is basically they took whatever we have in system and application and they used it in network, like Ansible, Puppet, Chef, and whatever. And it's true, we have a very rich history. Some would say it's fragmented fault history, but I think we have a very progressive history and it's, uh, it served its purpose. When there is a workflow, when there is a new use case, somebody will come up with a new tool that fixes this. So in system and administration, we were in system and applications, we have been doing it right. We have been doing it the pragmatic way. Okay, I want to emphasize that. But one thing we are missing that network have, we don't have standards. Yes, we don't have specs except now. I mean, since Bobbit moved from Bobbit 3 to Bobbit 4, it became a an official language. Maybe Ruby, I don't know about Ruby. Chef and Ruby, is it a standard? Is it to the Ruby specs language or not? I don't know. Yeah. Oh, yeah? No, I think it's one hour maybe. Yeah, one hour. We have time. So what I'm trying to emphasize here, that we started at 1993 with CF Engine, and we're still continuing with new uh, configuration management automation tools in different forms and different ways, okay? But even when we look at the history of network, they are the same. The people that accuse them of being uh, behind 20 years, 30 years, it's not true really. Academically, 
and in certain workloads and certain environments, they have been researching the topic since a long time. For SDN, there is a very nice paper they wrote to SDN. Uh, it shows basically the research that caused SDN to start. And SDN picked up in April 2012 when Google announced that they have been using it in their uh, data centers in, in the Open Network Summit. Okay, And Google now said SDN is the default, which is not in the enterprise, but they said that. So basically, they have a rich history also, the network. But their history is mostly academic protocols, standards, which we don't have. When we look at the network perspective, they started at the same year, 1993, with SNMP. SNMP, they, they claim that it, that it didn't serve the purpose. When they claimed it didn't serve the purpose from management point of view. From monitoring, it did serve the purpose to a certain extent. But from management, you never see anybody managing uh, a host or a switch using SNMP. The S in SNMP stands for simple. It's not meant to manage complex things. Yes? <laughs> S-flow, net flow. I want to spend some time on this one. It's not like us. There is software, there is a topology, there is hardware. Automation for the network is not just software. You have really to think holistic view. The ones in red is actually hardware. So basically, the cloth fabric. Yes, this is hardware. Uh, the OpenWRT, the wireless. OK, it's a hardware. I like it. Uh, there's the white box and the BK8. This is hardware. And this hardware actually made a disruptive uh, revolution in the network requisition. Do you know how long is the refresh cycle for network devices? Do you have a clue? Do you have a clue how long a switch stays in the data center? Five years? Who says five years? No. On average, yes. Ten years? Fifteen? Twenty? We have. <laughs> we have fifteen years switch. And we have ten years switch. No, no, no. It's <laughs> switches live. <laughs> okay? The, the average life cycle is from seven to ten years. But you can just renew the support contract. And you renew it how long? Another seven, ten years. OK? So you have the chassis. is basically, they stay a really long time. And this is a problem. And this is one of the main problems that I want to uh, get rid of. So when you go back, please tell your uh, finance or your planning or whatever, change the uh, retention cycle or the refresh cycle. If you don't have programmable switches, this is one of the challenges that you will have. OK? The one in Burble, Snap Route, they are creating switches and containers. Yes? So now, the, basically, your switch will come like a container. You want a new switch? They will give you a container, and you run it. So now you have your tasks. You have your team. You have your management on board. You want to start. Make sure you have a testing environment. Make sure you have a sandbox. Yeah, GNS3, especially the latest edition, seems to be great. Uh, VRNet Lab is a container-based lab. You still need the images from your uh, account manager. Uh, EVE next generation is also good. If you are running Cisco, you have to have the viral images, unfortunately. This is one thing we need to tell our vendors. Basically, we need to run testing. If we need continuous integration and continuous delivery, we need basically to push our vendors to give us virtual images. OK? How can we learn? How can we test? Again, from the survey of the network to code, uh, you see two views now. I wanted to see which tools are popular and which tools are not, or which tool, which, how is the awareness regarding tools. So. The first tool, Git and Ansible. You need basically version control, and you need an automation tool. The Abstra, the last one, is an, a commercial intent-based operating system. It does the whole life cycle from A to Z. You design, you plan, you provision, you maintain your network setup from a single centralized place. It's awesome. There are open source. There are open source trials since the last two years. 
And actually, they were on the last slide. So we know which tool to go with. <laughs> because it's popular, we chose Ansible. Ansible is really doing, uh, is like the main tool for network. And for network. Uh, the only tool that is competing with it is Salt Stack, or Salt. I always call it Salt Stack, the company name. Why Ansible? Because people think that's agentless. Puppet and Chef also are agentless when it comes to network. They will create a proxy, and the proxy will talk to the network via ABI, like it's talking to Amazon or anything like that. Yeah? But Ansible is very easy to learn. Ansible is very easy to deploy. And this is a problem. This is not a, this is not a, this is not a feature, it's a problem. And that's why <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a problem, yes. Because basically it encourages individual, individualism. It doesn't encourage teamwork. When you use Ansible as a, as a network engineer, you start creating playbook, adding roles and stuff like this, and you forget about everybody else. Yes? You don't use version control, you don't use anything. So <laughs> this book, Automating Linux Administration, the author warns against this. So if you want to start automating using Ansible, make sure to ensure that there is a collaboration between your team from day one. Make sure that you have version control set up, development workflow. Make sure that you can manage the scale. So you have the best practices in terms of directory structure, in terms of using roles and stuff like this. And don't use roles straight away. Okay, let your team learn basically how to create a playbook first and stuff like this before you move into roles and the, and the uh, best practices that Ansible recommends. Testing. Testing is a must. So, I said we have to choose a small task. So we chose the tool now, but we need a small task. So how you do it? You look around you. When I start my operation day, what things I do, and if I can improve it, one, one thing at a time. I don't want to, the network engineer doesn't want to learn Git, by the way. This is the, the hardest thing to think that it is there. So basically try small things, small wins. Yeah? Start with a simple use case. So the development workflow, our network engineers actually are Windows users, mostly. They can use VI, but hardly. Uh, so I wanted a workflow that is familiar to them and that they can learn. So VS Code, Linux, Windows, Mac, it's available everywhere. And the user interface is fantastic and integrates with Git. So basically it will be like one user interface for them. Yes, and you don't really need to know Git that much. And GitLab, and GitLab will allow them to have history, version control, a wiki for their documentation, and GitLab 10 especially is like a full life cycle, and you don't care about the operating system. Even the editor you can use from GitLab itself. So you can even forget VS Code. And automation platform, AWX. AWX has surveys, has workflows, has lots of things. So it, it will stay, it will scale up with the task that we will do. So this is the solution, this is the technology that we are proposing. Okay, so what's the first thing we do? Editors. They're using Notepad. The moment you give them an editor with syntax highlighting and just uh, a little bit checking, yes, this is changes things. So this is the first thing, this is the first way. Okay, so we talked about the software. Remember what I said? Automation for network is not software. It's other things also. So what, what is my recommendation to my team? My recommendation is to take care of themselves. The management, basically now we are running Cisco, Juniper, whatever. Why don't we run white boxes? If I run white boxes, I save like 5% of the price. Basically it will cost me 5th uh, fifth, fifth of the uh, uh, proprietary price. Yes, and this saving, I can spend it on training, I can spend it on the team for the next five years. And actually, I'm not saying that. Gartner is saying this. And they made the statistics, they made the research. Uh, so whatever we gain on the next five years, we put it back on the team, on the people. 
and I found this protocol, which says premium people requires premium compensation. PB, RBC. Yes? You get it? I have a problem with the B and B, yeah, accent twice. <laughs> For me, it's the same. Think ahead. So basically, you, you solve the so, uh, you solve the the uh, technical solution problem. Look what can, the end. We notice that the refresh cycle is an issue. Okay, handle the the uh, refresh cycle because if you don't handle it now, you will suffer seven, ten years in front. So better handle it now. So recommend standard hardware, white boxes, open source, open standards. So you can have whatever protocol you need. And if you need netconf, you will have netconf. If you need open config, you will have open config. If you need yang, you have yang. Whatever protocol that comes up next year, three years from now, it's just a matter of install, not like the traditional devices where you cannot install. Yes? Uh, insist on modern hardware, insist on programmability, insist that at least you have netconf on the device. And if you are running three tier, ask them, why don't they run spine and leaf? Spine and leaf have proven to be a very scalable way to increase bandwidth for workload, and most of the workloads are actually east and west. Yes, and the latency is much less. There are lots of benefits for spine and leaf in terms of bandwidth, in terms of uh, automation and stuff like this. So bring it up. Maybe the next project will be spine and leaf. It doesn't have to be the whole data center. Our problem, we are uh, a greenfield data center. We cannot uh, basically burn it and start a new one. But if there are new projects. We can evaluate. We can actually test. So, so that's the uh, that's the hardware side, and that's the software side. And my timer is sleeping, so I don't know what time. Is. <laughs> okay. So let's do uh, configuration management 101. Usually, it's desired state and current state. And if the current state is not like the desired state. The controller force it in Kubernetes and any uh, basically configuration management tool. Yes. So, in network, how do I get the desired state? I get the desired uh, state from the controller. If I have an SDN controller, I will define my policy there. If it's Ansible, I'll define my playbook there. How do I get the telemetry? How do I get the current state? There are like SNMP, or there is telemetry protocols, or there's netconf and restconf, or Maybe syslog or maybe other protocol. Yes? Okay. So this is an example of what IETF is recommending. And the vendors also, by the way. The vendor is pushing this also. So basically what they are pushing, they say the CLI doesn't work. The CLI, you have to worry about the timing. You have to worry about the interactivity. You don't know if your uh, Python library needs to be updated for a new switch, for a new version, whatever. It's not guaranteed it will work 100% all the time. SNMB, they say it failed us management-wise. But we took the best practices of SNMB and CLI, and we add the, the, the network operator requirements, and we come up with certain standards. Yes, netconf, restconf, and yank. What are these? So basically, yank is a language, a language that describes data structures. Describe constraints for this data and describe what kind of data types. And you can basically describe anything. One example uh, by David Barrasso is basically describing a Star Wars movie and which actors on the movie and stuff like that. So basically, you can describe anything. You can describe a topology, you can describe the component of a network switch, you can describe the elements of a network switch, and so on and so on and so on. Yes? It's meant to be the unified solution to multi-vendor device discrepancy. That's our hope. It's not there yet, I think. I'm not sure. But that's our hope. But it is the way. Netconf from the name. Net configuration protocol. OK. I'm nearly there. Netconf is the net configuration protocol 
it was designed in 2006. So when it was designed, nobody thought about RESTful at that time. So it is a little bit heavy. It uses SSH over port 83. And it's meant to create, delete, uh, replace a configuration. OK? The new com there is another one that is RESTful. It's lightweight. It's RESTful. uses RESTful call over HTTP. So it can work along with uh, Netcom. And basically, both will use Yang to, de to communicate the data. Yes, this was last week. Ivan Bibniak, if I pronounce his name correctly, is so frustrated that basically the vendors don't get it yet. You cannot have a device, even modern one, that basically is uh, really programmable. You still have to put a layer on top of it, an abstraction layer on top of it, so that you can actually manage it. It's not just the traditional devices that are a problem, even the modern one. Yes. So, we know this. Yeah, the problem with standards, there is always a new standard that creates another friction. So this is an example of how NetConf with RESTConf and Yang will work. This is the architecture. So let's say you have a client, which in this case is Ansible. Uh, I took this, by the way, from Charles. Where is Charles? Yeah, here. Charles did the, yesterday, he did the Open Daylight presentation. So I changed his uh, sketch, and I put Ansible instead of a client, because that's what Ansible does. So basically, you have Ansible as the client for RESTConf or uh, NetConf, and he will communicate using either NetConf or RESTConf. If it's NetConf, it will be port 83 over SSH. If it's RESTConf, HTTPS. And it can use multi-heterogeneous. This is a heterogeneous environment. And you have, in, uh, in the switch, this is another thing we don't have as system. You have the candidate, the start, and the running configuration. So you can actually make differences in stuff better than us. Yes? So NetConf can understand that and can manipulate it. And this is how it looks like. Do you like it? So this is the same playbook. It will work in a heterogeneous environment. Do you like it? I don't like uh, network, our network engineers like it, by the way. Huh? This is how it looks like if you don't use the NetConf module. So basically, you look the line on red. If it's an I/O, if it's an ARISTA device, you just pass the, the command as it is. As an initial step, this is what the network engineers like. They want something that is human readable and is not in their way. They don't want to change their working way yet. So start with what they like. Now, to declare or not to declare? So basically, do you want to use the netconf? Or do you want to use, basically, uh, specific network commands using Ansible module specific to the uh, vendor? I think the specific to the vendor is actually OK as a, best, as a first step. One, way, one thing that is great about Ansible, when I started using Ansible with network modules, I tried to stick to the supported Red Hat modules. But I had found corner cases, like, for example, the CLI is interactive. How do you pass an interactive command to Ansible? You say slash NY or what? There are people doing it this way. But there is another Ansible modules from the community, from the network to code community. They can do this. When you install a new update or upgrade, you need to say yes, yes, yes. So this one will do it for you without uh, worrying about it. Uh, there is Nibalum, which is an abstraction layer, and it's very good with Yang. It can actually retrieve some facts, and it can write some configurations using Yang. So basically, this is the abstraction layer for the future, Nibalum. And always hit refresh. So basically what you do, you select the task, OK? You start nagging your planners, your financial people, about the topologies and the hardware. 
you fix a task, you go refresh another task or make this task better. And that's what we call continuous improvement. I'm finished. If you have any questions, please ask. Thank you. And The slides are up, by the way. Uh, they're already up on uh, on the.